would take your Bibles and let's open the book of Daniel, book of Daniel, the fifth chapter, reading verses 13 through 17. Daniel 5, 13 through 17. Then Daniel was brought in before the king, and the king answered and said to Daniel, You're that Daniel, the one of the exiles in Judah, who the king my father brought from Judah. I have heard of you that I've heard of you that the spirit of the gods is in you, and the light and understanding are excellent and excellent wisdom are found in you. Now the wise men, the enchanters, have been brought in before me to read this writing and made known to me its interpretation, but they could not show the interpretation of the matter. And I have heard that you can give interpretations and solve problems. Now if you can read the writing and make, no, make it known to me in its interpretation, you should be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around your neck and shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, Let your gifts be for yourself and give your rewards to another. Nevertheless, I will read the writing to the king and make known to him the interpretation. May God bless the reading of his word to us. You may be seated. In the first four chapters of Daniel, God is, you'll see that God has used Daniel and his faithful Hebrew friends in some remarkable ways to bring the person and the power of Jehovah to, to light to the absolute ruler of the world, King Nebuchadnezzar. We saw it, and again, if you look at it through the chapters in chapter 1, you see four young men, only in their teens, they decided they would not eat from the king's table. And in the stand against idolatry, they'd grown strong. And they recognized the superior in their insights and wisdom. In chapter 2, they were spared from death with Daniel's interpretation of the king's dream. And they've been rewarded by promotion into the king's service. In chapter 3, you see the three friends of Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They stood against worship of the king, and they lived through the punishment of being thrown into the fiery furnace. And in chapter 4, Daniel had interpreted Nebuchadnezzar's second dream. And after that, and after the king had gone through years of insanity, Nebuchadnezzar's mind was restored and, and, was, and his testimony is found at the end of chapter 4. He said this, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, for all his works are right and his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he's able to humble. Now we can't know the heart of King Nebuchadnezzar. But I think we could properly take from the chapters previous to chapter 5 that the Lord had chosen to instruct and drive pride from Nebuchadnezzar, with a result in testimony to praise Jehovah as a sovereign and just God. Now we come to chapter 5. We've got chapter 5, a little history. Nebuchadnezzar had died probably about 23 years previous. There was a replacement ruler that ruled for about six years. And the next king that had come in, whose name is Nabodius, so history tells us, had been ruling for 17 years. Now, Nabodius was an idol worshiper. And historians will put him living most of his time in present-day Saudi Arabia for religious reasons. So what he did is he left his son, Belshazzar, as a co-regent or co-king to rule from the primary city of power in Babylonia. So in this chapter, you're going to see Belshazzar references a son of Nebuchadnezzar, and actually it's best understood as Belshazzar being in the lineage of Nebuchadnezzar, actually Nebuchadnezzar's grandson. We also see at the end of this chapter, chapter 5, you know, and I was thinking we read in, in the beginning of worship in Matthew 5, it said at the end of uh, Matthew 5, 34, sufficient for the day is its own trouble. Well, in this chapter, we'll find that the king really exemplifies that. If you look at chapter 5, by the end of the day, the Medes and the Persians come in and he's dead. It's a bad day for, the, for our friend, for Belshazzar. But here, he's, at the end of the chapter, the Medes and Persians come in. 
Now, interestingly, if you look in history, historical uh, records, you'll find that uh, the fall of Babylonia came after a siege by Darius, who finally diverted the river that was surrounding the city and marched in at night and found the king of celebration. And, and he thus ended the siege. So we see this, interestingly, well lined up with the, what we find in the fifth chapter of Daniel. Now, the way we're going to go about this, we're going to walk through the, the book of the fifth chapter of Daniel together, see some of the lessons that God has for us. And at that point, uh, we'll stop, I'll stop and comment as we go. And at the end, I'd like to draw a few applications we can find from, from this the, uh, in, in the fifth chapter of Daniel. So if you've got your Bibles, you can follow along. We're just going to walk through the fifth chapter of Daniel. Verse 4 verses say this, King Belshazzar made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in front of the thousand. Belshazzar, when he tasted the wine, commanded that the vessels of gold and silver that Nebuchadnezzar, his father, had taken out of the temple in Jerusalem be brought, that the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines might drink from them. Then they brought in the golden vessels that had been taken out of the temple, the house of God in Jerusalem, and the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines drank from them. They drank wine and praised the God of gold and silver and bronze, iron, wood, and stone. It's party time in Babylon tonight. Now think about this. The level of celebration, having a, a banquet for a thousand of your lords and all the... All the, the, the the folks around them, the support, the concubine, all those are there. That's not unusual for a king to do in this age. But think about this. We know that this city is under siege. They're in battle. You've got the Medes and the Persians surrounding the city. So what does the king in his wisdom do? He throws a party. So you can see from the beginning there's a there's an interesting lack a lack of wisdom found in the king. When the kingdom's in the balance, let's celebrate. Eat, drink, and be merry. Literally, for tomorrow he's going to tonight he's going to die. They passed, so she said, "Let Daniel be summoned, and he will interpret." Now remember, at this point, Daniel's an older man. The honor and position he had in the past had been taken away from him. While he remained in the court of, <coughs> excuse me, in the court of the king, he was not in the inner circle, as he was in the past. It's no wonder, for in this king, Belshazzar, he thought indeed he wasn't interested in the God of Israel or the people who served him. We see this in clear form by Belshazzar's des desecration of the temple vessels. But I suppose Belshazzar figured, what, I got to, what did he have to lose? The rest of the court was useless to him. So he called Daniel in. Verse 13. And then Daniel was brought in before the king. The king answered and said to Daniel, You are that Daniel, one of the exiles of Judah, whom the king, my father, brought from Judah. I've heard of you, that the spirit of the gods is in you. And that light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. Now the wise men and the enchanters have been brought in before me to read this writing and make known to me its interpretation. But they could not show me the interpretation of the matter. But I have heard that you can give interpretations and solve problems. Now if you read the writing and make known to be the interpretation, you should be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around your neck. And be the, shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. Now he again gets the picture that Belshazzar brings in Daniel. And note how he addresses Daniel. Not with any respect. Remember, Daniel had been the counselor to the king, Nebuchadnezzar. No respect did he bring him at this point. The elderly man, Daniel, was addressed in a manner to put him in his place. He said, you're one of the exiles brought from Judah. Yet he thought by offering Daniel riches in position, that he'd be a, it would be enough to entice him to exercise his abilities and to bring the solution to his dilemma. Once again, no recognition by Belshazzar of the God that Daniel worshipped. 
Now we see how Daniel answers it. Verse 17. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, Let your gifts be for yourself, and give your rewards to another. Nevertheless, I will read the writing to the king and make known to him the, in the interpretation. O king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar, your father, kingship and greatness and glory and majesty. And because of the greatness that he gave him, all peoples, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. Whom he would, he killed. And whom he would, he kept alive. Whom he would, he raised up. And whom he would, he humbled. But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened so that he dealt proudly, he was brought down from his kingly throne and his glory was taken from him. He was driven from among the children of mankind and his mind was made like that of a beast and his dwelling was with the wild donkeys. He was fed grass like an ox and his body was wet with the dew of heaven until he knew that the Most High God rules the kingdom of mankind and sets over it whom he will. And you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, though you knew all this, but you have lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven. And the vessels of his house have been brought in before you, and you and your lords, your wives, and your concubines have drunk wine from them. And you have praised the God of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood and stone, which do not see or hear or know, but the God in whose hand is your breath and whose are your all your ways you have not honored. Pretty bold statement that Daniel does. Daniel standing before the king Belshazzar. And in contrast, some of the ways that he acted with the two belt to Nebuchadnezzar Daniel's pretty direct and to the point. He doesn't start off with any of the niceties you normally see with a king. You even saw it with the queens. Oh, king live forever, which is kind of the, the genuflection and term that you would have done for the king. He doesn't do it. Daniel doesn't do that. And Daniel turns down the riches and positions offered him. So the king around him, so that the king and those around him understand that his answer is being given not from an earthly reward, desire, not from the desire of an earthly reward, but as fulfillment of Daniel's divine calling as a prophet to the God of Israel. Verses 18 through 20, Daniel gets to the heart of the matter. Belshazzar had the example of how Jehovah had dealt with Nebuchadnezzar, a king with more singular power and authority from a human standpoint than Belshazzar. Daniel states that the Most High God has, had established Nebuchadnezzar in his position of kingly power and authority, and that that same God had dealt with him harshly, dealt with Nebuchadnezzar harsh, harshly when his pride, when his pride raised up and replaced understand and replaced any understanding of Jehovah's royal role in establishing and maintaining the kingdom. Till at the end, Nebuchadnezzar knew. This is a quote. The knew that the Most High God rules the kingdom of mankind and sets over it whom he will. Nebuchadnezzar recognized Jehovah for who he was in his sovereign power and rule. But Belshazzar had none such recognition. And as you see that in verses 23, 22 and 23. And, I just, and you have praised the God, at the end of verse 23, and you have praised the God of silver, Daniel said of gold and bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which you, have not, which you do not see or hear or know. But the God in whose hand is your breath, and, who are all, and whose are all your ways, you have not honored. The difference illustrated by Belshazzar is that he stood as one who has placed his heart in trust in the idols of the day. And it, Belshazzar had ignored the clear illustration of the power of Jehovah that it was illustrated to him in the life of his grandfather, Nebuchadnezzar. While Nebuchadnezzar had been humbled, as we've got to see in chapter 4, Belshazzar had not been so humbled by the testimony of the past. And Belshazzar's ignorance 
of who God is was profound. Even to the point that Daniel recognized that Belshazzar did not know that God held his life in his sovereign hand. Verse 24. Then from his presence, the hand was sent, and the writing was inscribed. And this is the writing that was inscribed, meaning, meaning, tinkle, and parson. This is the interpretation we have. Meaning, God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Tinkle, you've been weighed in the balances and found wanting. There it is. Your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. So from this basis, this Belshazzar was a godless man who lived in a life in opposition to Jehovah. Daniel turns us and interprets the writing. It's interesting you read the commentators of the day and they can lead you to a number of views. And I'll leave that for another day. But one of the interesting points, those three terms, those three words, <coughs> different words written on the wall are all terms of currency. Amino 60 shekels. Tinkle is a shekel. Paris, I've got a half shekel. So in one sense, the people in the room could, could truly have read, if they knew Hebrew, could have read the word. Couldn't have figured out the meaning. So you've got that, and he interprets it, meaning God has established the length of your kingdom. This is what he's telling Belshazzar. And he's ending your kingdom. Tekel, you have personally been judged, and in the end, fall short of the divine evaluation as a person before Jehovah. Parson, your kingdom is being given to the Medes and Persians. Jehovah, through Daniel, had, been, had made pronouncement on Belshazzar's kingdom, which is about to end, <coughs> and had passed judgment on Belshazzar's life before a holy God. He tells them that the army surrounding his capital city will be victorious. So think about, and we go down to verse 29, how does Belshazzar react? I mean, he's just been told, you're going to lose. Medes and Persians are coming in. God's not particularly enthusiastic about who you are. Verse 29, Then Belshazzar gave the command, and Daniel was clothed with purple, a chain of gold was put around his neck, and a proclamation was made about him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was killed, and Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. So again, how does the king react? Does there, is there a plea at all from Belshazzar for, is there any contrition or a plea for mercy? Does he ask Daniel to intercede before God? <clears throat> no. In the face of this clear illustration of Jehovah's sovereign hand, and Daniel's prophetic words about his and his kingdom's doom, doom we see a mixed message. If Belshazzar had thought Daniel impudent or had seen the interpretation as wrong, he might have summarily had Daniel killed on the spot. Which you could understand if you basically go before the king and say, and tell him what he doesn't want to hear. But then by the fulfilling of his promise, by the purple and the proclamation, he illustrates an acceptance of Daniel giving a true interpretation. Yet we also see that for Belshazzar, there's no impact on his life or his actions, even at this late date. He goes on in rebellion against Jehovah until the end. It just happens to be the end is pretty much at hand. So as the closing of the chapter tells us, that very night found the fall of the kingdom, the death of Belshazzar, and Darius conquering the kingdom and assuming rule. And as we find as you go into chapter 6, the reestablishment of Daniel in a position of power and authority. Then what does this passage bring to our minds and hearts? Let's take three points of application. First, the success and successes and failures of this life will be governed by the hand of our God. Daniel came to Babylon not of his own doing, and in the court of the king he had been used in many marvelous ways. And as a result, Daniel 
you know, in his life had been rewarded in areas of professional service and had gained the material rewards for such positions. Yet later in his life, these things were taken away from him. In this passage, he was summoned to the king, and the only recognition that would have that he gained would have been the one that he had <clears throat> upon coming to Babylon. Daniel, you're the one of those exiles from Judah. And after this, in chapter 5, Daniel gains again a position of prominence in the court of the new king. It's not for us the positions in government that should stand out. It's the fact that our God had prepared a role for Daniel to faithfully serve his God in each example. For us, our God has prepared us opportunities to serve it in each phase of our lives, from young to old, in areas of height, and sometimes in areas of low standing. We're reminded that each one is established by our God for ourselves. So let us rely upon God to prepare us for each situation, and may we be prayerful and prayerfully prepared to be faithfully serving Him in the situations that God chooses to place us in. Second, there's only one God we need to follow. In this chapter, we see a king and his people who worship gods made of wood, stone, and precious metals. They went out of their way to blaspheme the person of Jehovah. And in its end, those gathered were confronted with his power and heard clearly his pronouncement of judgment. We ourselves are in a society that has established idols of plenty to steer and influence even us. The people of God today must always realize the idols of this world are empty and powerless. You work for fame in the position you're in and recognition, they can pass in an instant. You want to be wealthy? You get yourself absorbed in Powerball fever and examine what would I do with all that money? Yet even those who achieve wealth find it doesn't cure any of all ills, ills in life or answer the questions of the heart. Yet we can be lured into becoming idolaters and setting these things as our priorities and goals. And when this occurs, when in our lives we become idolaters and forget in reality it's God who made us, God who saves us, and keeps us both now and forever, when this misfocus becomes the central portion of our lives, we become as blind as Belshazzar. While we are not people, we can lose our salvation by action. In doing this, we lose the comfort and joy such recognition brings to us. <clears throat> Stand in awe of God always. He is your sovereign. It is he that you must follow in both words and life actions. He must always be our primary focus. Finally, God is our sovereign, and he is abundantly merciful. Neither the kings we have spoken of in this chapter bear the favor of God. Both were sinful, and in their individual characteristics, we see illustrated actions which would merit only the judgment that brings separation from God and eternal judgment. <clears throat> Yet in the case of Nebuchadnezzar, we see Jehovah humbling him again and again with a redemptive plan as the outcome. In Belshazzar, we see by his actions the king exalting himself before Jehovah and blaspheming him in his actions with the conclusion being judgment and death. And the reason for the difference is not the merit of the individual, but the sovereign hand of God is reminded in Romans 9. What, this is in Paul writing. What should we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. And I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. If your heart's not been softened, these words will have little impact or consequence to you. But understand as you leave this place, you have been told that salvation is found only with those who have cried out to God for mercy. But remember that God does extend mercy, his mercy to those who flee to him. And as we turn to him in faith, and we recognize that Christ has died to death to purchase salvation on our behalf, 
we begin to see the depths of God's mercy to us, his people. You can ask me, think of those questions. Why have I been called? There's nothing in me that merits such blessings in life, let alone the inheritance of eternal life. The only explanation for us is God's sovereign mercy that chills each one of us in spite of our own stubborn pride and self-centeredness and opened our eyes to the depths of our lost nature and our life without Christ. Recognize how wide and how high and how deep and how long is the love of God that he has shown to us, his people. And how will you respond? At the end, what, is the, what are the things that you ultimately long for? What is your greatest treasure? It should be this. That as, as your life concludes, that you know that you will be eternally clothed in the garments of salvation in Christ, that you will be invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb, and that you will hear the words, Well done, good and faithful servant, from the same Christ who gave himself to you. May that be the longing. May that be our greatest treasure as we look at the sovereign God who called us. Let's pray together. Our God, we have spent some time this morning in, in looking at the way that you have ordered your hand amongst the kings. And our God, we see your servant Daniel. And I, we know that you raised him up. In this chapter 5, as he was set aside. Yet through it all, we see the faithful thread that is there. He is a faithful witness to who you are. And he reveals the strength of a sovereign God. And we think of us, your people, how you put us by your hand as one of your children. And we pray that we might see this example, even as Daniel, wherever you put us. When you grant us that opportunity, that we might be faithful, we might be ready to answer as your ambassador, as your representative. This we pray together in Christ's name. Amen. In our closing, let's stand together.